here, not necessarily only because they are alive, but because they want to commune with you. We take the full benefits of this communion with you, this encounter with you, and we do know as of a truth that indeed we'll come out here stronger, we'll come out here better, we'll come out here more glorious, we'll come out here working in a seamless way all through our life. We thank you for the opportunity and the privilege to come before your presence. Father, we pray that you teach us yourself, help our understanding, grant us all the knowledge that we need, and let us, through this knowledge, do the right things, being endued with wisdom from on high, help our understanding, and help us to walk through these processes, glorifying you, honoring you, humbling ourselves before you, and giving all the glory to you. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. Praise the Lord. I think we, the MM is too, it's not loud enough. I think it's, um, we're still very strong. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. Praise the Lord. Yes, not like soldiers. Thank you. I want to thank and greatly appreciate my father in the Lord, the regional overseer, the pastor, and the pastor in charge of the unit, Daddy Joko. And also to thank all of you and then the rest of the pastorage for the privilege to stand before you this evening. But much more so, let me thank the Holy Spirit who has made it possible to me to be here, who I know indeed has been my director and who has been my guide. Thank you, Father. Thank you because you loved us even before we loved you. In Jesus' name, I pray. Praise the Lord. We're going to talk about sleeping laborers in the season of harvest. Again, just to inform ourselves that we are in a season where we are going through a program aptly described as explosive growth. We know about Vision 2032. And we're going to make the 40 million mark. And that's what we see. 40 million mark in 10 years is to us an explosive growth. And so how do we get to that point? And all of the teachings as we have around this period is probably trying to prepare us and bring to our consciousness the need for us to be in the right frame of mind for this growth, to be prepared physically and spiritually to achieve the objective of Vision 2032. And today we're discussing laborers in the season of harvest. Let's quickly read Proverbs chapter 10, verse 5. Let me have... Um, Uh, can I have a good? The he that gathereth in summer is a wise son, but he that sleepeth in harvest is a son that causeth shame. Two different. The one who gathereth and the one who sleepeth. One is described as wise and the one as a shameful person or a fool. The other is Matthew chapter 9, verse 37. Technical. Matthew chapter 9, verse 37. Please be fast. Um, all right, good. He said, He unto his disciples, the harvest is truly plenteous, but the laborers are few. The harvest is truly plenteous, but the laborers are few. These are two verses that actually are very striking in terms of our responsibilities. And our responsibilities come from the fact that Christ said that much before he departed. In fact, that's what we call the Great Commission. So what we are saying in effect is that when Christ has given us a responsibility, we cannot shake that responsibility. And the Great Commission is all about going to the world and then preach the gospel. And wherever you go, I'll be with you unto the utmost part of the earth. As many as accept, baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son. That's the consequence of the Great Commission. And like we always say, when a man comes up with his will, or statements, 
or things he says before he leaves in, 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 the, in the realm of our secular world and natural life is before he dies. It's called the will. That will actually is a full, um, well, it's a full encapsulment of what he believes in, what he wants done. And so he, he is a man, for example, he's an old man, he has looked through life. He can think back. Some of us cannot think in that way just because we are young. But if you are much older, you begin to see that you are, you are remunerating, you are looking back at where you are coming from and counting the cost. The mistakes you made, right? And then the things that you have done, and the things that you have done, things you put across to your children, write them down as your will. You have come from that, and just before you part, you put down what you desire. And so you can see that evangelism is in the heart of God. And that's why it's a part of the That's the logo. And it's a part of the world. Go to the world and preach the gospel. In case you are forget, and not often, it's very easy to forget. We say, when you get salvation, when you think you have, and when you are basking in that, in his glory, in his guidance, in his leadership, in the leadership, you don't think, what do I do? What should I do? What do I do? And what that occurs to you is, do things that are right. Work according to the will of God. There are assignments that will seem not to be over, uh, or not to, to be remembering often. The assignment is that of the Great Commission. Go and preach the gospel. And so some people think that I can go through life, the preaching is over, only Jehovah weakness, um, the rest of us, and maybe some of us may not know, there are pastors who have pastored us here, who will enter vehicles eh, and be preaching the gospel from here to Oguashuku, and then they were back from Oguashuku. They now enter another vehicle, preaching the gospel. As an exercise, what they do. Every day we see them in church. No person knows what they have done. Some of us don't even know. Some will know and talk about it. But you see, it's one very important aspect of our existence that we cannot throw away. We can do all the good things in the world, give all the thanks in the world, heal the sick, you know, and all that. Yes, there are all the very, very good things you do. There are good works to be fired. But just don't remember, forget that the things that you do with respect to winning souls are alpha max. They are max, that, the very high max. They are the things that Christ will love. They are the things that Christ will ask at the end of the day, what have you done? And what did you do? Where is the evidence? And that's about the Great Commission. When Jesus said there were few laborers, I'm going now to the passage, introduction. His disciples were there with him, and many of his followers were also there. The harvest was plenteous. His followers were many but not available for the harvesting. And so when Christ says in what we read in Matthew 9 that harvest means laborers are few, he took cognizance of the fact that with him are so many disciples. So with him are very many people who are following him, his people. And yet he says, he can see clearly that despite this number, as committed as they are, they are just not enough. For so in common, to become harvesters, to become soul harvesters. Now, the situation has remained same today. There are many members, many of them even registered as workers and ministers, but they were, they were on as if there is no harvesting to be done. So, we are not the as there is no harvesting to be done. There are to be done. They are not responding to the calls of God. They are not responding to the call of the mission. They are not responding to the cries of the unsaved. They are completely unaware or concerned of the antecedents around them on, on, on Sundays. Only those sleeping can make this. Indeed, the harvest is plenteous. But there are few laborers because the people of God are sleeping in this of harvest. But how can they be sleeping when they come to church? How can they when they come to church? Ask yourself, how can I be sleeping when I still come to church? Can we say to ourselves, how can I be sleeping when I still come to church? But are you really sleeping? The first few things ahead of me here are the symptoms of, of a sin. Uh, Believer, the sleeping servant, the sleeping parent, see the sleeping. How can you know if you are speaking? If you are speaking, sleeping during the harvest. How can you know? Now, who is a laborer? Who is a laborer? Because we're talking about the laborers are few. Who is a laborer? The first thing to ask yourself is: Am I qualified to be a laborer? Am I qualified to be a laborer? Now, if you are qualified, praise the Lord. If you think you are unqualified, then think about how you can get qualified. That is criteria for qualification is salvation. You cannot be preaching to people. You cannot be bringing people to the kingdom of God when you yourself have lost the way. You are not there. You have to be there to appreciate what it is to be there and to now have the inner, inner belief of the different ingredients 
between you and the other man of Christ. If you don't have that inner belief, it's self, it's, it's self um, what do I say it now? It's self acceptance, agreement within yourself that indeed you are a child of God. Like Romans chapter 8 says, that the Spirit of God administers to the Spirit that lives in us that we are truly the children of God. And so you have that conviction once you have the Spirit of God living in you that indeed you are a child of God. Once you know that you're a child of God and the Spirit has convinced the Spirit in you that you're a child in God, and so you can now, I would dare say, boastfully, in, in brackets, think about you as being numbered, that Christ has called you my own, that Christ made a choice of you, that he chose you and anointed you. Now, once you have that conviction in your mind, then you are beginning to stand to walk. But if you don't have that conviction, of, if you still live in doubt, if you still wonder, am I, am I really saved? Am I really a child of God? Is God really working with me? Is he there? Can I feel him? Now, once you are working on that, you really don't have a conviction. The reason why you go for people to preach the gospel is just because you have a conviction in you that you are standing on a higher ground. If you think you are standing on the same ground, how will you preach? You preach unconvincingly. But if you think you are standing on a higher ground with a self-conviction that indeed the Spirit of God has ministered your spirit, then you can have the, the urge to preach. You can have the urge to ask. You can, you can have the feeling that this one is walking away into the darkness. And that I am still standing in light. And I now have a responsibility on me to ask and to bring him to the light. That compassion, that responsibility comes from a conviction of difference. And I call it a gradient between where you stand and where they stand. That's so, salvation is the first thing. The other thing is working with the Holy Spirit. If you are not working with the Holy Spirit, if you're working all by yourself, if you can't remember what Christ says, that, look, hold on, I'm going to walk away. But in fact, I'll come back, I'll send a comforter who will teach you the things. Uh, remind you of the things I have taught you, teach you many more things to come, and then be your guide, your pathfinder, your comforter. So if you're not working with the Holy Spirit, then you are working amiss, because you're not working with the flesh, you're not working with your personality. You can't be a worthy Deborah. It tells you there's a need to do this, that puts it in your heart, inspires you to say, I'm going to work. Too quite often we come out here, on a few more days, in the morning hours, sometimes in the evening hours, let us, let us do evangelism. There's a vehicle around, there's a driver, we don't talk, we don't to, um, um, what do you call it now, shop right, and some other places. You don't leave your home just like that. Say, I want to I want go play. No. Many guys be conviction. Today you want to win souls. Today you want to respect God. Today you want to obey God. Today you want to see the opportunity to preach. Too often we don't have that opportunity. But now there's an opportunity, there's a privilege. Uh, let, let, let's talk, let's talk. No, that's what we say that matters. No, that the Holy Spirit is not work. All we need to do is pass, let a bowl of water and God will give the increase. And so once you have that feeling, that's where the drive to be a laborer comes in. Now, if the Holy Spirit is not in you and you don't have a salvation, you, you really don't, you don't, you don't stand on a strong footing to go and become a laborer. Bert, you must labor. Have you known God?
haven't sacrificed yourself into God, you have a responsibility to live right with God and to do the needful, to walk in his vineyard, to, to give your all, to give your all, to give your all, either in his sanctuary or somewhere else. A number of persons have stayed here, like daddy says, they have become customers for so long. Just sit down in the, in the, in the, in the chairs here, in the choir. You do nothing for years and years. You don't have an interest in the corporate body. Because you were talking about a corporate entity where you have people come in there every day to become customers. And those who, have, who are supposed to be stakeholders in the business. There are different categories of people. Customers just come and go. Stakeholders come and remain. The kingdom of God is looking for stakeholders, not customers. Praise the Lord. Praise Master Jesus. And so when we look at the first, is it, so when you look at this qualification, you now find that that's, that's, the, that's where we need to start from. So are we sleeping? If we're not sleeping, then we must be awake and fully awake. The symptoms are very many. People who are asleep do not use their eyes, even if the eyes stay open. In other words, it's very possible for you to have our eyes open, our ears wide open, and all that, and yet not be seen, and yet not be hearing, and yet not be able to speak. The mouth is there, it's open. People can hear you talk. Your ears are wide open. You can hear. You can even see. But the question is, what are you seeing? What are you hearing? What are you speaking? It's the Holy Spirit that actually ministers unto you to it's, it, this is not, it's not, it's not it's nothing too strange for you to say the right things at the right time, to hear the right things, or to see the right things. And so a lot of things can be happening around us, and yet we didn't see them. Are we blind? Sometimes we don't know we are blind. We are really blind, except the Spirit of God reveals to us. And if you look, if you read the Bible, typically, let me give you an example. There are many times you read the Bible over and over. Sometimes it looks like a literature book. You remember Moses, you remember Aaron, you remember the, the sister, and then you, you go back and know that, the story of the Hebrews and all the children of Israel. And, but if you read in between and allow the Holy Spirit to guide you, you begin to see the various sections. In fact, you start reading in between lines. And the import of those actions is what God has packaged together to teach us the way, to teach us his own ways, the principles and the precepts. All right? And so that's when the Holy Spirit comes into you. Now you begin to understand the book from the perspective of the Holy Spirit. And so without the Holy Spirit, you'll be looking without seeing you be thinking, yet thoughtless. Praise the Lord. So let's look at Isaiah chapter 4, Mark, okay, Mark chapter 8, verse 18. Oh, thank you, Carl. Where are you? Sorry, let me help myself. Thank you, Carl. Is it projected? It's not here. Sorry, I'll be there. Don't worry, just worry. Right. Having eyes, see ye not. Having ears, hear ye not. And do ye not remember? Yes. We're talking about Mark 8. And that Christ was talking about those who are, actually not, who are not in the spirit. You know, who are not in the spirit. Now, those who will have eyes and yet cannot appreciate the things around them just because it has not been revealed to them, they are still acting like they are, they are, you know, blindfolded because they are not in the spirit. Now, let's look at Isaiah 43, 8. It says, being fought the blind people that have eyes and the deaf that have ears. The blind people that have eyes. They are blind, yet they have eyes. They have ears, yet they are deaf. All right? They can hear. So these are examples. And that's why I said the Holy Spirit is a very important factor with respect to the walking in the, in the house of God. Now, Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 21. Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 21. Are we there? Hear now this, O foolish people, and without understanding, which have eyes and see not, which have ears and hear not. They are all alluding to the same facts. 
that indeed we can be looking and seeing physically and yet spiritually we are blind. Now, the other one is that that is the symptoms of somebody who is actually sleeping. The symptoms. The fact that you are very, very physical. You are very so much of your natural self. You have so much of your body, your, your flesh, you know. And how many, of, how many of us are actually so much of the flesh and have dropped the spiritual goals in our life? And when uh, we we'll come down to where the, some of the things, we can see how the flesh has propelled us, has pushed us towards driving a process and leaving the spirituality behind us. And then we think we are doing well. We're so happy with ourselves. And yet we are empty. And Christ, Christ says, now let's look at it. Um, Psalm, Isaiah 5.21, I mentioned that. Now, let's look at Psalm 115 verse 5. They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes have they, but they see not. Now, verse, the next one is Matthew chapter 5, verse 29 and 30. They cannot see the reality of hell and the plight of the unsaved. So let's, let's look at that. Matthew 5. Now, and if thy right hide offend thee, plug it out, cast it, in, cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. So, now what does that mean? You cannot see the reality of hell and the plight of the unsaved. So, in as much as they are not seeing, what are they, what are they not seeing? What are they not hearing? They are actually not seeing, they are not seeing the issues that are abound with the spiritual eye. Now, if you have a spiritual eye, there are things you might see. There are things you might consider. And the flesh contends with the spirit. And so the spiritual eye will be contending with the natural eye. What the natural eye wants to see. And what the eye sees is a factor of what the brain says. What the brain makes it to see. In fact, the eye sees, guess what the brain and the brain interprets. But if the brain is, if the brain is under bondage by the evil force, the eye cannot but see the evil, I mean, the flesh, and will not be able to see the spirit. And so, essentially, it's the Holy Spirit that takes over everything about you. And so, why people, why, why you now have to cast away a part of the body is because if this part of the body is polluting you, so for you to come to that point, and it's not, it's not talking about just your eyes, it's talking about anything that you hold firmly to, respect and adore as part of your, of, a part of your personality, and that thing is against the Holy Spirit. It's against the kingdom of God. It's against the principle of the Holy Spirit. Now, if, if there are things that you hold on to, let me look at pride. That's a terrible thing. Pride is one of the worst crimes you have. And some of us have pride in ourselves. And some of us think it's just being, you know, you're talking about you, it's, it's, it's yourself, you know. You, you, you have a feeling that I'm worth X and Y. And one, what happens over time is that because this feeling of you know, self-actualization or whatever, you now begin to have a pride and I, 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 I mean, you ascribe many things to yourself and you keep saying, I'm X and Y, I should be respected. Um, you know, let me not give examples of people. But we know that happens because of our age, because of the wealth, because of our finances, because of who we come from, because of all kinds of, there are very many reasons. You, you stop seeing yourself as a simple person. You see yourself as that complex bit that needs to be respected and anything done about you, you can see it from the, from the perspective of an ill done about you. You are actually, in that wise, you are actually respecting your personality, your self-esteem, exaggerated self-esteem. And once you start that the self-esteem, you, if you carry that, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And what I say in that one is drop this self-esteem of yours. Drop what you think you are. Drop what, you, what monies you have, what cars you have, what intellect you have, what powers you have. Drop them. Come neat, come fresh, come naked. That's what God is telling you. And so when he says your eyes are going to go out, pluck over eyes, don't go into the kingdom, it's because of the, the, the excess luggage that you carry along of life. Thinking that what makes all life. 
from, a lot of us are pursuing many things. You see that every day calculating how you can make money, how you can set up buildings, how you can set up structures, how you can buy a car, including how you can even take care of other people, children, and all that. that yes, there are, there are responsibilities. And then you suddenly forget in driving those primordial things that there is a more powerful and more important thing, what Christ called the needful. When Christ had Mary and Martha, and Martha was about the everyday practice, prepare food, take care of a person, clean up, arrange, and somebody was sitting down with Christ listening, that was Mary. And he told Martha, this is the needful. When the Jews killed Christ, they didn't know that they were doing the wrong things. They thought that was the right thing to do. There was a man that was going to face at the end of the day, at the judgment seat of Christ. They didn't know. Ignorance. And so ignorance can allow us to do the, that thing that is not right. And so once you are not walking in the spirit, you are most likely not to be walking for God. So the spirit is very important. That controls everything that you go. You must covet it. You must ask for it. You must, you must be by faith believe that the spirit lives in you. Praise the Lord. Praise Master Jesus. And the seed is their own needs and challenges. John 6, 26. All that they see is their own need and challenges. That's what I alluded to now. John 6, 26. Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, You seek me, not because you saw the miracles, but because you did eat of the loaves and were filled. That was after he has taken care of uh, the, the multitude with five loaves and two fishes. He was telling them what was important in their mind. So what is important in your mind? Let me ask us today, right now, think about it. What's important in your mind? Have you really come to the point where you've made up your mind, I'm going to give all to Christ, that he becomes primus inter he becomes the first among every equal in my life, that Christ is and it's everything. That's the point. Have you come to that point where you have made up your mind that Christ is most important? You can mount it. You can think about it. But do you have a conviction in that direction? In that wise, everything else, everything else, and I dare say everything else, including family, the church, family, the crowd, congregations, the, everybody, they come after Christ. Christ becomes the primary thing. When you come to that point, that's when you, are, you can tell yourself that you are not symptomatic. You are not suffering from sleepiness as a child of God. When you have made up your mind. It's a personal conviction that I want to work with him, but I want to work with him, give him my all. I want to work with him because I want to come here. How many of us are here? The church is bigger than this. Yes, many persons are engaged, but many more persons can come only if they have this conviction that he is the number one thing to go. So he takes the place of every other thing else. Every other thing else comes second. As long as you are not handicapped or destroyed, Christ comes first. What do I mean by that? Christ will give you reasons to do what you need to do when you need to do them. And you need, you need to go about them because in that wise, you are working for Christ. But when, in, when it is time to come to church to worship him, when it is time to come to church to evangelize, when it is time to, come, to contribute to church, when it is time to do something in his kingdom, that's when you become a laborer. You are not, if, you are, you are, you are, if you are paying your tithe, thank God you are a laborer. If you are giving offerings, thank God you are a laborer. Beyond tithe and offering, you are doing let's go out fishing. Beyond that, we are coming to church to clean the church, to clean the sanctuary. Beyond church, we are going for outreaches. And in all of this, one of the cardinal things is to bring men unto Christ. And so once we have decided that he is number one, and we are no longer pursuing the things that are most, I mean, that we consider critical and most important to our life, we are now allowing ourselves to give those things a second place. My buildings, my house, my practice, my profession, my children, my, you know, you know, there are a whole lot of things you can say to that. But immediately you have said so. Now, it's not, I'm not asking you to denounce and push those aside. God knows what to do. But I'll tell you closely, and I'm, not, I'm talking from, a, from my experience, that the moment you give to God, God takes care of your own. So all the bothering you bother for your own amounts to nothing in real sense with respect to what God's plan has for you. And so do it the right way. Take care of God and leave God to take care of your own. He says, seek ye the kingdom of God hmm? and his righteousness and everything else will belong to you. 
And it's not just seeking him. It's seeking him in the terms of practicalizing what you should do in his kingdom. And they see, all they see is silver and gold. But in this instance, it's their only vision. Yes, silver and gold. Well, that's very, it's human passion. It's natural passion. It's a human tendency. It comes in from a various innate nature to pursue things. We went to school. I went to school. You, you strive hard to make the best remarks. You make a, 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 good, a good first class. You work in an office. You, you are very productive. Your bosses say you are very good. Beautiful. There's no doubt about that. All those things are very good. But the point still remains, and God helps you to do all of this. But God still remains that you must please remember why you are pursuing all these wonderful things and making all the, getting all the accolades and getting all the marks and everything. The wealth that you must not forget that there's a work to do in the household of God. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. There are, now, people who are asleep do not use their ears. All right? People who are asleep do not use their ears. Now, I didn't want to read all the verses, but let's look at Isaiah chapter 48, verse 8. We read it before. Isaiah 48, verse 8. Bring forth the blind people that, they, that, that have eyes and the deaf that have ears. These are examples of people who don't have all of this, who have ears and yet they are not useful to them. Jeremiah 5.21. Let's repeat that verse again, as important as it is. Hear now these, O foolish people, and without understanding, which have eyes and see not, which have ears and hear not. May the Lord help us, uh, help our various parts, our ears and eyes and all the other faculties that we have to be directed under the supervision, tutelage and directive and direction of the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Now, they are deaf to the command of the Lord. Matthew 28, 19 and 19 to 20. Let's look at that. Acts 1, 8. Matthew 28, 19 and 30. Matthew 19 says, Go ye therefore and teach all the nations, but as in them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. That's one command. 20. He says, 20 please. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world, the Great Commission. So sometimes they don't hear. So if you are not hearing this, if you are not going to the uttermost part of the world, if you are not going to preach the gospel, if you are not going to bring them, if you are not going to teach them what you have been taught, the principles, the Bible stories, the verses in the Bible, you are not going to teach them, you are not going to remind them of the things that they, maybe they know, then you are deaf, you are sleeping. You are sleeping. You are the typical sleeping Christian, sleeping son of God, sleeping laborer. But if you don't want to sleep, then you must awake, arise to the call, to the command of the Great Commission. Praise the Lord. Praise Master Jesus. They are deaf to the cries of the unsaved. Yes, the cries of the unsaved. Cries of the unsaved talks about the passion you have. And I have said, except there's a gradient between you and the others, you cannot see the difference between both of you. If you see yourself as standing on the same platform, you can't see the difference. What drives a current is the difference in potential. The electric current is driven by the difference in the potentials of one point to another point. Is the electrodes move from point A to point B, cathode to anode, just because they have the difference in terms of their chemical or electrical property. And so gradient also drives water. Water moves from one point to another point because the other point is lower. And so it goes to a lower point, it floats down. So are many things driven by gradient. Now the gradient is here. If you are a child of God and you don't carry the power of the Holy Spirit in you, you don't have the understanding and the wisdom of the Holy Spirit, you don't have the influence of the Holy Spirit working on you, you don't even have a template of God, you don't have an antenna to hear from God, and you're just like that. You can't see yourself at the same thing as the other person. You're just at the same level. Where is the passion? It will not flow. Passion is what, I mean... I mean, the, the, the potential differences, the gradient is what flows the passion for you to appreciate that this person is not doing well. Just because I'm convinced I'm doing very well and I know where I'm going to, I know who I am. In that wise, I begin to say yes. And so when I realize that, that's the way the passion comes from me. Passion doesn't come when I think we are the same thing. And so the first thing for us to do is to grow up, grow up and get committed. We have received salvation, but we go beyond that. We want the words. God says, if you abide in me and I abide in you, ask anything in my name. Ask. I will give it to you as the Father. How do I abide in you except I know the word? Is the word that abides in you 
that I abide in him and that he abides in you. It is the word. And so once you cannot teach them the word, once you don't know the word, you are just stagnant. You are standing in one place. So you must move. You must get acquainted with the word. You must pray. You must hear from him. You must commune from him. He is never a static personality. Never. It's we that are static. As long as we hook on to him, we are on the move all the time. Praise the Lord. Praise Master Jesus. So the issue here is now people that are asleep are un unresponsive. Okay, well, let me look at the, the other one. They, they are deaf to the cries of unsaved. They are deaf to the empty, they are deaf, deaf to the empty seats around them. The blind to the vision 2033. Okay, so 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 if you are not responsive, if you're not reacting, if it's like these things are happening, you don't know. Obviously, they are happening, you don't know. It means that you don't even can't see. It means that you can't even hear. It means that you can't even speak. That's the, that's the spiritual uh, incapacity that you have. But physically, you are, you are capacitated. But spiritually, you are incapacitated. And so if you don't have, have all those things, and so if you cannot see, Vision, vision 2032 uh, talks about being as many as 40 million redeemites all over the world. You won't appreciate it. It will just be like a slogan. You don't feel it, but you can hear it. But if you hear it and feel it, then you can respond to it. If you hear it and feel, and, and feel it, then you can respond to it. Now, when you feel it, that's when the Holy Spirit is inspiring you to appreciate the fact that we need to. And that there are lost souls, the unsaved souls. There are very many. Where are they going to? And therefore, you respond and react adequately. Now, people that are asleep are responsive who say that. Now, even if they can see or hear, they are indifferent and unresponsive to the, to the sight and cries of the harvest. They have, no common, they have no compassion to the lost, unconscious of people sleeping to hell every second. Yes, we know, but are we living in consciousness? We know that many people die every day. There are, there are scientific literature that talks about the number of people that die every day. Some of you have it that the number of women that die in Nigeria from childbirth, eh, you know, in probably in one month, is like a full plane, you know, a full plane crashing, or how many of them, so many planes crashing every day. That tells you people die in Nigeria from childbirth as many as there are multiplicities of full loaded planes crashing regularly and continuously every day. It tells you the amount of people that die every time. We are conscious of that People departing from us. Everywhere we look around, people will leave. Obituaries are there every day. But are we conscious? Are we, do we feel that indeed some of these people need to be saved? Are they leaving us saved? Are they in right standing with God? If our answer is they are not all in right standing with God, then we are challenged. If we are in right standing with God, then we are challenged to make more efforts to bring them to God, to be of right standing. All right? They have no mouth, but they can speak. Psalm 135 verse 6. Can somebody help me? Psalm 135 verse 6. Whatsoever the Lord pleased, that did he in heaven and in earth, in the seas and in all the places. And so, it, it says they have no mouth, but they cannot, they have mouths, but they cannot speak. Now, the, this verse appears to be incongruent, but the point is that God is sovereign. And once you realize God is sovereign, and God says, do this, and you know what he wants to do. If you are not responding, and talking, and speaking, and spreading the gospel, actively, at least by one-to-one -one evangelism, then you are, not, you are still sleeping. Because the one who is sovereign, who can do whatever he needs to do, has spoken. You have neither heard him. If you heard him, you are not taking him serious. They would not go out to the harvest field to look for the unsaved. We said that, I think, Psalm 115 verse 7, that they don't have this urge. And I've, I've said... What drives this urge is the gradient between you and the unsaved. They are not able to do a follow-up. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 27. Proverbs 12, 27. 
Proverbs 12, 27. It says, the slothful man roasted not that which he took in hunting, but the substance of a diligent man is precious. So it just talks about the slothful man and a diligent man or a hardworking person. So, I mean, a man can kill, um, uh, you know, can kill uh, whatever it is, hunting, goes hunting, brings in what he hunts for, lives there and goes to sleep. And the thing will just rot it up. It just tells you the idea. The issue of follow-up is that we as diligent Christians cannot afford to go for evangelism and bring them every time. And they become first commands and we shake hands with them and we don't just forget about them. We are slothful. We are not diligent. We must follow up. We must follow up. We must remember them. We must have their numbers. Even if you're not doing that, as we, you must be doing something. You must be doing something. Thank God there's a whole lot of things to do. You can send your money to those in the mission field. You do that. And there are very many. If you have addresses, one, they have them. Around us they are. Around us they are. We have a, one of our daddies here who's quite interested. They are. And I'll tell you, sometime in the past, I was sending to a group in, in Jaws. I have been there before. I went with the evangelism to them, but and it was a youthful thing. I was very impressed. It was a night, a, a night of, a night I'll, I'll hardly forget. I can see the amount of youth that came for that outreach. We were bubbling, the, all that. And I saw what we were going in the hinterlands of Jaws. So whenever I came back, I said, no, I must key into this. So I kept sending money to them. They would call me, and that is to say, from Interbars, whatever I had. Nothing too big. And even here at Abraka, even here at um, somewhere, we, the, the, we went to them somewhere. Somebody could remind me. Oh, they had Aningene. Aningene. Aningene is not too far from here. We have somewhere to do. There are very many of them. If you can't go, if you can't do anything else, give them 10 naira. So that you'll be registered in heaven. There's a, story, there's a book that talks about all that we are doing, a book of recording that will be open at the end of the day. Let me see that you are doing something. And I'll tell you something. Take one step. Leave it to the Holy Spirit. He will create privileges for you, opportunities and privileges for you to take further steps. And he's going to assist you. So he drags you in, incorporates you. Just begin to take one step. All right? So find time. We have a welfare thing here. The welfare people, yes, accept it. Some of them don't know. Some of them do know. But when you assist them, you're assisting them. When you, when, you, when you sow into welfare, no matter how small it is, it's, it's worthy, and I'll tell you, there are a lot of blessings. But you find that you have much more to sow more as you carry on, even for welfare here. And so in the, in the other fields, you must follow up and you must make the first steps to go up. Dangers of sleep, uh, sleeping during harvest. Now, sleeping during harvest is means that when everybody is ready and the harvest is plenty, there's harvest now. You should not afford to sleep. 20, uh, vision 2032 talks about no person should sleep, whatever it is. Bring up, put up your thinking caps. Let us find out how best it is to get to the goal of bringing about 40 million people into the fold. The fish mission might have its own. It's modifiable. It can be modified. And it's modified for a good purpose. But the important thing is that after we've espoused and planned and kept on, you know, on table all the plans, who will carry out the plan? Who will drive the vision? Who will be there? Habakkuk 2, 2 talks about the vision being written. Who will drive the vision? And that's where the laborer who is not sleeping comes in. A lot of us are not taking that important. If we're not doing anything else, let us key into vision 2023. Find out what he's doing and let us drive it in whatever small capacity we, we can. Whenever we are free, whenever it's, I mean, I, I, um, whenever we have the opportunity, we should go ahead. Daddy was telling us that everyone should bring at least one person to church, one person this month. Just one person. And you can sit down there. I'm sat down there. I've identified the person I can, I can bring. But of course, he just said one. So I can say I can bring five. And so just that's, what, that's how it works. There's, nothing, there's no, nothing to it. Make up your mind. Go out there and preach to one person. Preach to two people and bring them to the fold. That's vision 2023. And allow God to give the increase. Praise the Lord. Praise Master Jesus. Many Christians are not growing and are stale. Why? Because there are, there are, there's no flow. It talks about the Dead Sea and then the Sea of Galilee are near each other. But one has no life in it, while the other have life in abundance. Now the difference between the two of them is this. What's the difference? The Dead Sea has no outlet, so it stays full of salt and never gets freshened. The same is true 
of many Christians. So the, red, the Galilee flows out, the Dead Sea is one small circle. I've been to the Dead Sea, I've been to the Dead Sea, and I was quite, and I was taking, uh, frankly, it was, it's like any other river, looking so fine and so good. But if you stay in the Dead Sea as a person, you can float, you won't sink. You won't sink. That tells you the specific gravity of that water is so high. You will go there and stand. The water will carry you. You will not sink. But they are what, just close your eyes. Find something to cover your eyes so that because that water is full of magnesium sulfate, salt. The, the highest point of magnesium sulfate concentration all over the world. So if you go there, you see it. When you talk about the Lot, the Lot's wife, as, that's where that's the environment. You see everything, all the salt, sand, they are all salt collected. So that's a sea in one small area. And then in the real side, you can see that flows away. It's, it's a dead in nothing in that sea lives. Nothing. There's no life. And so it's the reason why one is alive, the other one is that one is a conduit, the other one is a stagnant. And if you are a conduit, Christ will not pass through you. Sorry, if you are stagnant, rather. But if you are a conduit, the glory of God will pass through you. Christ's life will pass through you. You live the life, the Shekinah glory of Christ will be in your life, everyday existence, in your workplace, in your home, in many other places. That's how it comes about. And so once you allow God's glory to flow through you, you are not the Dead Sea. And how can God's glory flow through you if all that you are taught and you know, all that you have learned over time, you muzzle it, you keep it to yourself. You cannot let it out, you cannot talk it to people. If, if, if you now bottle it, you are, you are just one stagnant pool. As long, as long as it flows through you, you become a source of information, a source of divine anointing and divine glory. And so that's the same thing. So many Christians are like that. The same is true of many Christians who never share their faith. One of the greatest rewards of being active in gospel work is that God's life flows through laborers to the one who it is intended for so that the channel gets new life and new revelation. Matthew 28, 18 to 20. Again, now let's look at Mark 16, the same thing. Let's look at Matthew 28, 18 to 20, quickly. And Jesus said, and Jesus came and spoke unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and on the earth. Praise the Lord. 19, 19, please. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. 20. 20, please. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Now, Mark 16, 15 and 20. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. All right, let's go see 20. Let's see 20. And they went forth and preached everywhere the Lord was working with them and confirming the word with signs and wonders. Amen. And so, the same thing he has espoused, what's called the Great Commission, is essentially what we are discussing today. And he says, Go. Are you sitting down? Are you lying down? Are you hearing? Are you seeing? Are you thinking without yet thoughtless? Are you seeing without, are you looking without seeing? But if you have this Holy Spirit living in you, then you can appreciate your environment. You can see better. You can see what the Lord is saying. Eternal hunger and loneliness. These are the, the con consequences of being still. You are not moving. You are like the Dead Sea. Eternal hunger and loneliness. John chapter 4 verse 36. Eternal hunger and loneliness. And he that repeat, uh, receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto life. So is that correct? 36, please. 36. John 4, 36. All right. And he that repeat, receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that repeat may rejoice thereafter. Eternal hunger and loneliness for those who are still. Your harvest is your eternal reward. That is why you must be urgent, you must be urgent concerning the harvest. The soul you gather now will determine how God will pay you your eternal wages. In other words, if you, if you look at what happens life hereafter, the souls you have won are part of your good works and are part of your wage that you're going to gather. Now, divine wrath, Proverbs 24, 11 and 12. Proverbs 24, 11 and 12. If thou, forbe 
forbear to deliver them that are drawn unto death and those that are ready to be slain. Yeah? 12. If thou saidst, Behold, we knew him not, doth not he that pondereth the heart consider it, and he that keepeth thy soul doeth not uh, thy soul, doeth not he know it, and shall not be, and, shall he, and shall he not render to every man according to his works? In other words, you cannot pretend because God knows everything. God knows everything. So you cannot say, I don't have opportunity, I don't have privileges, I don't know, I have not been told. Or give all kinds of reasons because God knows. And so he's going to recompense you. He's going to pay you according to your wages. Now, we as children of God do not want to stand before the Lord without doing what he has asked us to do. So, but that we stand before the Lord. We, can, we don't want to have eternal damnation or accusation. Jeremiah 8, 20. The harvest is past. The summer is ended. And we are not saved. At the end of the day, if you miss the opportunity, when you want to meet God, everything would have gone past you. This is the time to make, to make amends, the time to be active, otherwise you have lost it. Now, evil will prevail in the land if you do not do anything. The harvest will be destroyed and ineffective workers will be put to shame. All right? So that's the end time when everything seems to have passed you, everything will be destroyed. And it takes for evil to abound for good men to do nothing. So that if we decide not to save, talk, yield, work in the, in the harvest, all we, what we're trying to do is that we're going to slim feed our membership in heaven. And what that means is that we will not have the kind of companionship we're expected to have. And in fact, we may not make heaven indeed because we have... We have not fulfilled the conditions so to do. But he says that if we continue, we we'll then increase the, the kingdom of God, we we'll depopulate the kingdom of the devil, and then we we'll increase the kingdom of God. And it takes, it takes for evil to abound, for good men to do nothing. When good, not, when good men do nothing, the evil grows, it abounds. In conclusion, those who are asleep spiritually are blind and deaf to everything that pertains to the soul out there. Even though the harvest is plenteous, they see nothing to bother them. Even though there are empty seats around them during, this, during Sunday services, they are happy because they can sit more comfortably. Just as any good farmer will be ashamed of his son who did not work during the harvest and let the crops work so hard for go to waste. So we bring shame to the heart of our Heavenly Father when we spend our days in idleness. Some of us are like Jonah who was spending his time sleeping in disobedience in the, bowl, the hold of the ship running from God's call to walk in Nineveh when he should have been rushing to the harvest, harvest in Nineveh to harvest them. Or perhaps we are like Peter, James and John who slept because of weariness or indifference while they did not, while they did, uh, while, uh, so indifference, like they did on the, on the night before Jesus was crucified. We remember those stories, what happens to Jonah? We remember those stories, what happens to Peter, James, and John? Peter, James, and John particularly, you could say they were very tired. But then, if they were conscious that their master was going to be taken from them, they were going to be killed and humiliated in such a way, that holy anger, would not have allowed them to sleep. So they, they were a little bit indifferent, not appreciating what is there. In fact, they could be said to be blind because they were not seen. He said, he told them so many things prior to that time, at supper, before supper, in prayers. And they asked him, and someone, Peter said, never. And yet, he didn't know he was blind to the realities of the things that were happening around him. He didn't have the spiritual eye. Praise the Lord. Now, if you are in this condition, Paul wrote a message to you in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 14 to 16. Wake up, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. Awake thou that sleepest, 
it is time to awaken to the great urgency of the need for evangelism. Shall we pray? Shall we stand up to pray? In Jesus' name, our Father, we thank you for the word that has come forth. We confess and ask for forgiveness where we have failed you. At this hour, Father, we wish you guiding us and by the Holy Spirit. Re-energize our minds, our intention, inspire in us the willingness to give our all, to be committed to your kingdom and to win souls for you. Father, we pray that by your power that we will be able to win souls. Father, we pray that by your power we will have the urge, we will have the inkling, we will have the pressure from within to comfort, to preach the gospel. Father, we pray that we will no longer be sleepers in your vineyard, that wherever we find ourselves, Father, awake us, make us conscious and awake to the things around us, to the spiritual things around us. Open our eyes to see, open our ears to hear, open our mouths to speak that which is right in your sight, such that we bring men to your sanctuary. Thank you, Father, because you've answered our prayer. Thank you, King of glory, for your love and mercy. Thank you, Holy Father. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Have you been blessed tonight? Can we please rise on our feet and stretch our hands in the direction of the instrument God have used to bring his word to us? What a word. What a time in the presence of the almighty God. What a revelation by the power of the Holy Spirit. Just open your mouth and pray for him. This quantum of knowledge that God have unveiled to us today will not be lost also on him. But the Lord himself will breathe upon these words. As he has come forth from his mouth, it will not be a judgment. Stand in judgment against him. God will give him a wisdom. God will give him a mouth. God will direct him by the power of the Holy Spirit to hear and to do. To be obedient to the heavenly vision. My father, we are grateful to you for using your son to bless your church. All of us together agree that it's a season for you to bless him and his family. Please bless him indeed in the mighty name of Jesus. Bless his family indeed in the mighty name of Jesus. My Lord, he has spoken those words. My father, we are asking. He shall not stand in judgment against him in the mighty name of Jesus. He stood up, O oh Lord, at this time. O oh Lord, to discuss the vision, to advertise the vision. Father, you advertise him in the mighty name of Jesus. Wherever he turn to, let your favor locate him in the mighty name of Jesus. For whoever is not of you in his life, in his ministry, in his career, let it be a sponge now in the mighty name of Jesus. We pray for him and his household. You perfect everything concerning them in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, everlasting Father. When next he has occasion to stand before God's people, you are anointing more in the mighty name of Jesus. Be thou highly exalted. In Jesus' miraculous name, we pray. Amen. I do not want these words to be lost on us, and I want you to take a moment and just ask yourself this question. Am I sleeping at the time of harvest? It's just you alone. Am I sleeping at the time I should be going out for soul winning. Is my eyes functioning? Do I have eyes that can see? And if I'm seeing, what am I doing about what I'm seeing? About dying souls. About people who are perishing. My friends in my contact list. My colleagues in the office. The people in the city where I live. What am I doing about it? 
your neighbors? If I have ears, are my ears functioning? Is it hearing right? Or are they deaf? Father, what if you are hearing correctly? What are you doing? Say, Father, help me. Help me to respond to the call. To respond positively to the call. Ah, it's a clarion call that every one of us will shine the light of God in our life. Scripture says, we are the salt of the earth. We are the light of the world. It is in going out. It is in obedience. If you are willing and obedient, then you eat the good of the land. My Father, help me. Give me the grace. When next I hear about evangelism again, or when the occasion presents itself to me, my Father, help me to make full proof of my ministry. Help me. Pray that prayer for yourself. Oh, Lord God Almighty, I present myself to be used of you by the power of the Holy Spirit. As many as are led by the Spirit, they are the sons of God, they are the daughters of Zion. Lead me, O Lord, to see, to hear, and to act. For faith without works is dead. Help me, O God. Blessed be to your name. In Jesus' miraculous name, we pray. The Lord will help us in Jesus' name. Put your hands together for the wonderful things God has done for us tonight. You can do better than that. You can do better than that. Glory be to the Almighty God. It is now time for us to bring out our offering to say a big thank you to the Almighty God who have given us this opportunity to be reminded, to be encouraged, to be inspired, to connect with the vision. Bring out those offerings, lift it up to heaven and say a word of prayer as the choir gives us a song. Your love has taken over me Father, I depend on you I am confident in you You, oh Lord Father, we put our trust in you. We have no power for our own, we confess. It's not of you that will it, not of you that run it, it's of you that show mercy. Today we have heard your word. We desire to win souls for you. We are asking that you inspire us afresh in the mighty name of Jesus. Father, as we give you this offering, give us a hearing ear in the mighty name of Jesus. Give us a seeing eyes in the mighty name of Jesus. My Lord and my God, I'm praying as many who have given a money offering, give them beyond what money can buy in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord God Almighty, bless us indeed and let your name be glorified. We pray that this offering will be put to good use, even for the expansion of your kingdom here on earth in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, everlasting Father. In Jesus' matchless name we pray. Put your hands together for Jesus. Please give me a few minutes of announcement and we'll share the grace. Praise the Lord. Good news, good news, good news. We have opportunity of yet another Wednesday, an Open Heaven Hour. Open Heaven Hour is one of the special programs of this parish. It's a prayer meeting that is very loaded. Men 
It's not always to faint, but to pray. If there's a man who can turn out at the time God has set for you, bless you, you can be rest assured that your case will be settled. That man and the pull up beside that, I say, I have no man to help me when the pool is troubled. Before I could make any move, another have dived in. God knows that in this parish, open heaven hour is set to bless the members of the church. I pray that you make yourself available to receive of the blessing God has in stock for you. As you come, your blessing will not pass you by in the mighty name of Jesus. Then Wednesdays are also days for our house fellowship. We admonish every member of the church to attend house fellowship. Wherever people of God fellowship, there is the blessings of God. I pray to God as we attend this particular Wednesday house fellowship, the blessing of God, the commanded blessing of God will locate you and your family in the mighty name of Jesus. Thursday is our prayer meeting days, and Dr. Jesus is the one in charge. And with him, nothing is impossible. Invite your friends, invite your colleagues to come and fellowship with us here on Thursdays and pray to this God who answers prayer. And God will answer your prayer and turn those requests to testimonies in the mighty name of Jesus. I thought I would hear a bigger amen. Next Saturday, we shall be doing follow-up. I thank God for those of us who came last Saturday when we called for people to come for evangelism. A good number of us came, but many did not come. The question is, do I hear? Is my ear working? Am I deaf? Am I seeing the urgency of the matter? So that's the question. We have yet another opportunity this today to do follow-up. Will you respond to the call? Will you make full proof of the purpose God saved you? It's up to you. It's a choice. For those who respond, they say blessing. All their prayers are answered. As God will answer your own as you come in the mighty name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. Remember, if you are willing and obedient, what will happen to the person? You will eat the good of the land. And as we launch out in this parish, every one of us without any exception, we will eat the good of the land in the mighty name of Jesus. I thought I would hear a bigger amen. Can we rise on our feet now and begin to wave our hands in appreciation to the King of glory? who brought us the world, who enlightened our eyes of understanding, who drove away darkness that is blocking our eyes from seeing and removed every deafness and every form of inability to see the need for soul winning. Father, we thank you for all that you have done for us today, for the world you brought our way, for the miracles you have given to us individually and collectively. Thank you for the intervention. Thank you for answer prayer. Thank you for the urgency of the matter and for the inspiration to go. Father, as we go, let there be miracles, signs, and wonders to your glory in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, everlasting Father. In Jesus' miraculous name, we pray. Amen. Let's share the grace and fellowship. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with us now and forevermore. Amen. Look at your neighbor and say, surely.